Brought to you by Xeris. If you depend on Wi-Fi, you need Xeris. And Telecom Careers, the industry's largest resume database and job board. Welcome to Wi-Fi This Week. For RCR TV, I'm Sean Kinney. And I'm Martha DeGrasse. We're here to take a look at some of the week's top stories in the world of Wi-Fi and to take an in-depth look at Stadium Wi-Fi. And we're joined by Edgar Figueroa. He is President and CEO of the Wi-Fi Alliance. Edgar, thank you so much for being here. Nice to be here, Martha. Thanks. We're really glad you could join us. So one of the biggest stories in Wi-Fi this week, obviously, was Cablevision, a Wi-Fi-only mobile phone service, the first ever from a cable operator. Now, it only works with one phone so far, the Moto G, but it could grow. What do you think? Is this going to um, be a real threat now to the traditional wireless carriers? Well, it's, it's good news, and it's something we predicted. If you look at the, an announcement that we had for tw uh, 15 predictions for 2015, uh, just the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, you can expect to see more of these kinds of announcements. Uh, uh, cable and fixed line operators uh, have uh, a great opportunity in front of them because there's demand for more Wi-Fi. And uh, so I think Cablevision is sort of the first example of uh, uh, these operators moving on that opportunity. And the consumer will use by virtue of having more Wi-Fi availability and potentially attractive uh, uh, subscription plans that they can take advantage of. Right, and, and they're in a very dense part of the country, right, the tri-state area. Pe some people may spend their entire day, you know, in close proximity to Wi-Fi hotspots, right? A absolutely, and, uh, you know, as a part of the solution, of course, uh, you know, there will be seamless uh, uh, onboarding onto the network, even as people move about. So it, it's a, you know, it's a viable, you know, great um, mobile um, option for the, for the operator. Right, and I think it's, it's clear that Verizon's worried. We saw some legal squabbling later in the week between Verizon <coughs> and Cablevision. Verizon's ads claiming that their Wi-Fi is actually faster than Cablevision, so we'll see where that takes us. Sean, there was another big Wi-Fi story from the FCC. You want to update us on that? Yeah, that's right. I've been uh, following this in our, our print coverage. The FCC this week issued what's called an enforcement advisory, said in no uncertain terms that hotel owners and operators cannot interfere with guests who are using personal Wi-Fi hotspots to get connectivity. Uh, just a little background on that, this started in October when an FCC investigation found that the Marriott's Gaylord Opryland Resort in Nashville, Tennessee had intentionally sent deauthentication packets to guests' personal Wi-Fi hotspots effectively jamming them. So that resulted in a $600,000 fine levied against the Marriott company as expected, the company filed a formal petition with the FCC asking for firm guidance on the topic. A uh, few other hospitality interests got involved on Marriott's side, Google and Microsoft on the other side of the issue, and we got our guidance this week with that enforcement advisory. So, Edgar, I know that the Wi-Fi Alliance has not taken a position on this, but if you could just share your thoughts about the accessibility of the Internet. Uh, well, look, it's uh, it's always good to know what the rules are, and mm -hmm. and the good news in this case is that it's very clear now what the rules are for wh whether it's a venue operator or, or a large scale service operator uh, to operate within, and, and so now that the rules are are known, you know they'll be adhered to, and uh, we have clarity about how to how to uh, operate these Wi-Fi networks. All right, great, thank you. Well, let's jump into our topic this week, which is Stadium Wi-Fi. It is Super Bowl weekend. And we know that venues around the country, not just professional sports, but college as well, are putting a higher and higher premium on Wi-Fi and that quality of service. Earlier this week, we talked with an analyst in the UK, Professor Simon Saunders of Real Wireless, who helps stadiums and carriers figure out their Wi-Fi plans. Let's listen to what he had to say. Those venues uh, are increasingly concerned about the overall experience that, that both the spectators have in these locations, uh, as well as a lot of the people that serve the environment, the security guards, the broadcasters, the operational staff, you name it. Uh, and more and more, that means some form of wireless connectivity for those people, whether it's to, to share the experience with their friends in another stadium or to identify a troublemaker in the venue and so on. So they, they often come to us with some wireless-related challenge, that they want wireless to work better, um, that it may not be working well today. Um, it may be something that they they have an absolute requirement for. So, you know, we dealt with one stadium where they simply couldn't open this brand new stadium building until they'd sorted out the wireless coverage challenges in order that the place could be um, secured for the emergency services, that they had good coverage, that if there was a fire or other incident, they could absolutely look after it. So, so they have a mix, really, of motivations that are both kind of positive business impacts for them loyal, happy, 
customers and spectators through to real you know, important uh, hygiene factors where they've just got to make sure the building is, is safe. Either way, increasingly good quality wireless in these high density environments is, is really becoming business critical, you know, part of the amenities in the, in the building, not just a nice to have. Those are some interesting comments on the demand for in-stadium Wi-Fi. Edgar, what are you hearing from Wi-Fi Alliance members about this trend? It's a terrific trend. I think, you know, all of our members who work on making Wi-Fi better, they're all users as much as anything, right? And many of us are sports fans. So it's great. I, you know, I remember uh, back 10 years or so, my alma mater was involved in the college football national championship. And at that time, I had a hard time through throughout the game and just making a simple phone call. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, we moved from from that expectation and, and um, you know, demand for just simple connectivity like that to an era where people want to share video, they want to see instant replay and things like that. So stadium is probably the most demanding environment that you can have uh, for, for connectivity and these kinds of applications. Uh, you know, the good news is that uh, Wi-Fi is, uh, is there now and, you know, there are many variables that need to be taken into account to deliver a good experience uh, and increasingly the whole industry is evolving toward having the expertise to be able to do that and our members you know certainly are tracking this space Very good. okay great one of those members zero spoke with us earlier about their experience deploying large-scale stadium wi-fi let's take a listen to that conversation uh, we are seeing a lot of challenges in in large venues stadiums uh, as you mentioned, where you're competing with the the big screen and the and the comforts of the of the living room, and not and you know seeing that oftentimes you're fewer people are actually showing up to the games, and this can actually be the case in in college stadiums, for example, when you're trying to get the students in there, um, and even into the pro ranks as well. So in, in general, the whole experience of going to a, to a game is being augmented in many cases with lots of other types of activities, services, things that you can connect directly to the user. To the, to the fan in the seat um, so that he can um, have a much broader experience. Everybody is walking around with a mobile device today, so they're all bringing them to the stadium. So they expect to connect. They want to. They want to, you know, post to their Facebook that, hey, I'm here at the game, and, and I was there when, when whatever happened. Um, so it, it's definitely a, a compelling type of scenario for the, uh, the stadium, stadiums themselves and the, um, you know, the operators that are running those networks to support Wi-Fi to connect all the fans and to deliver potential services that can actually generate revenue for them as well, keep them in their seats and keep those opportunities available um, to interact with them uh, throughout the game and even beyond the game as well. You, you, you essentially set up an ecosystem, um, uh, you know, and applications that can be operated or run by the fan at a different time, you know, outside of the stadium on the concourse, in the, in the fan, in, you know, I'm sorry, in the game directly or, or even at home. So it's a uh, it, it, it's a lot of uh, a lot of activity going on right now. That's that's pretty interesting from from how these uh, these uh, games used to be played. You know, just five ten years ago, and, and there really wasn't any of this opportunity there. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about those opportunities because clearly these um, these volumes of Wi-Fi deployment are only going to be needed two or three times a year in some of these stadiums, and yet you know. They, they're paying for it, if you will, all year long. So, so what are some of the ways that the venues can monetize their Wi-Fi investments? Right, yeah, good question. So especially uh, in the, uh, say, college stadiums, if they're not, if they're general stadiums that are used just for the, for the purpose of the college or high school stadiums, things like that, they're, they're oftentimes only used during the football season. Um, other types of, of uh, locations, city-owned, Facilities, for example, might be used hundreds or dozens of times uh, during the year, so it's a little bit different scenario. But I think the, the, the bottom line is, for those, whether they're used a lot or, or a little, how can I get the fans in the seats? How can I monetize that? So what we're seeing is um, the rollout of ubiquitous wireless networks across these stadiums. I can connect every fan. Um, the mobile networks oftentimes are crowded as well. They can't connect to their provider oftentimes and even get to their 3G, 4G connection. So they can augment with the Wi-Fi. And then they can start to engage um, uh, on social networks uh, to broaden the experience um, from that perspective. And you can start then pushing services down to the users, such as um, you know, in-game uh, ordering of concessions or, or merchandise or even seat upgrades or uh, streaming video and, and player stats and statistics to keep them interactive with the game itself. So, and I could go on and on. There's many, many different things. 
I think what's what's happening though, and the trend is for the stadiums, the teams to create a branded application that is downloaded by the user, and then they use that to interact during the game with all these services. And there's there's a whole plethora of them um, that are available. Um, but the bottom line is uh, this this engagement um, scenario is is now becoming quite common. The bottom line, you need a solid Wi-Fi network to make that happen if you're going to engage that level, and that's. One of the things that we provide is, is ensuring that that experience is good. Otherwise, when I try to connect 50,000 uh, users on the network, it, you know, if it doesn't work, then they're going to obviously abandon that, and you're not going to be able to get the value. So, it's it's a building, you know, building blocks to create that solid infrastructure, and then and then to roll out the services on top of that. All right, Bruce Miller, Vice President of Product Marketing at Xeris. Thank you very much for being here today. My pleasure. Edgar, what are you hearing from your membership about some of the biggest challenges with stadium Wi-Fi deployments? Well, uh, we have the latest version of Wi-Fi, which is Wi-Fi certified AC, operates in 5 gigahertz. That's a great solution for folks to deploy in stadiums, uh, both because of its capacity, its ability to dispatch traffic very, very quickly, as well as its ability to deal with you know, very dense uh, uh, deployments. So, so that's great. You know, the good news is uh, there's already, uh, you know, validation that Wi-Fi is a terrific option. You probably saw um, during this year's national championship football game, uh, AT and T just Sean issued. Was there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just they just issued their statistics, and um, they had a, uh, I think they said six terabytes of data that went over their network, and uh, out of that six, five went over Wi-Fi. Is that right? I didn't that's know right. that. So, you know. AT&T companies like that wouldn't be saying that unless they were confident that a, you know, it's a great option. Uh, it worked very well, uh, and so um, I think the, you know, the some of the considerations that uh, folks thinking about this really ought to have in mind is Wi-Fi is robust. It's ready. Uh, they should have, uh, you know, a good backhaul, uh, enough capacity to deal with that kind of traffic on the back end, right on the core. Um, you know, making it as easy to use for end users uh, with solutions like Passpoint for easy on mm -hmm. authentication mm -hmm. onto the network. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, um, you know, work with professionals on the deployment because the architecture is key, right? Wi-Fi is very, very good, but you have to have a good network architecture, uh, you know, to, to have everything be ready to handle the load. Um, Right. So those are some things to keep in mind. Yeah, that deployment at uh, AT&T Stadium in Arlington is really robust. Uh, producer Joey Jackson and I went up there, and I can uh, attest, I don't know if, if we cracked the one terabyte, but we were certainly texting <laughs> and, and using social media a good bit. But, you know, unfortunately, some of these early large-scale stadium deployments have not really been up to par in terms of performance. Well, I'm sorry to say that there's rather too many examples that we've come across of of these buildings saying they want to have a fantastically good quality wireless system in place that they aim to be the you know the best connected stadium in the world or in the state or in the the country as the, as the case may be and then they face challenges that they'll procure a system they'll put it in place and it's more expensive than they'd expected or it goes in there and actually doesn't perform that well so you know it won't take your your viewers long to to you know to to have a look for stadiums that make those announcements and then go very quiet about the systems, you know, a few months later when the system doesn't actually perform as expected. I'm sorry to say. So, Edgar, what have you learned, and, and by proxy, what have uh, Wi-Fi Alliance members learned from past deployments that can help them improve future deployments? Uh, so, uh, you know, the first thing is, uh, is the architecture and just making sure that you have that laid out. Everything from, you know, the size of your cell uh, to the, uh, having a keen understanding about how much you can push through every, every access point that you're deploying, right? So just basic architecture, networking, uh, sort of uh, considerations. Uh, probably, uh, you know, the other bit is that uh, you have to have, you know, all the, all the back-end support for that traffic so that, you know, your, your broadband doesn't become the bottleneck, right? Um, and then lastly, you know, just to pay attention to um, the variability and the type of traffic that's going through there. So mm -hmm. localizing as much as possible, um, this, uh, the, uh, what might be on demand is, is key. Uh, there's uh, you know, a, a service provider, the cloud in Europe, that's been doing this for soccer stadiums for a while with quite a bit of success. And part of the recipe is they have uh, the, the media stored even for replays and things like that. Uh, you know, around cells and have incorporated that as part of, of uh, the wireless network. So they're uh, caching. That's right. So, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, a number of uh, techniques that you could employ, you know, to continue to increase the user experience. It sounds like, you know, planning and design 
is the key, right? It's basic fundamentals like that, yeah. yes. Well, what about just the, the density problem, though? I mean, uh, we always hear that, that Wi-Fi access points will uh, wait for one another before they try to make a connection. If they're all trying to make a connection in the same spot at the same time, doesn't that impact everyone's experience a little bit? Well, this, this goes back to having you know, a keen sense for uh, literally how hot every one of the spots uh -huh, is, uh -huh. right? And making sure that the, there is um, an understanding about the coverage for each one of the access points. Uh, so, all, you know, a lot of those techniques and best practices are already uh, known today. Uh, in addition, there's enhancements that we'll have to the protocol uh, that will continue to, you know, find their way to the market. Just things like fast session authentication, you know, onboarding client devices very yeah. quickly and sharing uh, more intelligence about the network topology uh, and additional techniques for network management. You know, all these things um, we can get excited about because you know it, it means that uh, the the intelligence in the network and the intelligence in the devices will work uh, in a cohesive way in the future, so that you know you really do have a seamless experience with Wi-Fi. Um, you know, and folks can forget about how it is that they're connecting because they are getting the best experience at the time. All right, mm -hmm. Edgar Figueroa, President and CEO of the Wi-Fi Alliance. Thank you so much for being part of our program. My pleasure. This has been Wi-Fi This Week. We'll see you next time. For RCR Wireless News, I'm Martha DeGrasse. I'm Sean Kinney. Thanks for joining us.